Hi, I'm Greg, and uh, I am the, the Director of Partnership and Research. And what I thought I would do is quickly kind of tell you just a little bit about myself um, and how I ended up at the FreeBSD Foundation and what my kind of journey with the open source community has been that's brought me here. And then just explain a little bit about what I do. So um, I've been in this job since April, so it's been seven months and it's uh, been kind of action packed. And so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, just sharing kind of what I've been up to and how I hope to work with many of you going forward. So, um, so kind of quickly just you know, looking at my career, and I did a variety of things before 2003, but my open source career really started in 2003 when uh, I co-founded a, um, a company uh, called Emu Software, and we built this tool called NetDirector, which was a, uh, basically like a POSIX uh, configuration management tool. So, um, and, and back then, most of the people that were running Linux or, you know, kind of using them in, in the enterprise, Linux or Unix and, you know, even the BSDs, were using it for kind of network services, right, typically. So they were running Apache and Bind and Samba and DNS and DHCP and stuff like that. So NetDirector uh, was a, a tool to manage fleets of these things, uh, manage the configurations of them. And we started out and we were not open source and we realized that, that we needed to be open source for a couple of reasons. One was because we were getting interest from some large enterprises and you know, the options were either like go through this com complex uh, source code escrow kind of thing uh, you know, or make our code open source. So you know, trust was a big part of it and so openness helped to develop trust but also we realized that um, we could really benefit from being open source because people could do things like load their, um, their configuration scripts up into NetDirector and benefit from things like role-based access control and you know, rollbacks and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of the things that you have today in programs like Ansible, we were, we were kind of looking at stuff like that. Um, you know, the, the financial crisis hit and, you know, I don't know about any of you, but I kind of flopped around for a little while and then ended up uh, at Sugar CRM, which is, was at the time an open source competitor to Salesforce, um, just down the road in Cupertino. So I was out here quite a bit uh, for that and that was really fun. Then I spent some time in consulting and there was an openness con sort of component to my role in consulting as well. So. I was working with this guy that I had worked with a couple times in the past, and he had developed this uh, application called See Your Network App, or Synapp. And what it did was it allowed executives and managers of organizations to kind of get past the, um, the, the, the sort of the org chart and the hierarchy and see how people actually worked together. So it, it um, was a survey-based tool and it was called an organizational network analysis. And so you could identify the people in your organization who were the other, pe the people that everybody else in the organization went to for information. You could identify the influencers regardless of where they were in the hierarchy. Um, so it was a pretty disruptive idea. And I'm gonna come back to that colleague of mine a little bit later. My first taste of BSD was uh, working with a friend of mine who ran Root BSD which is a company that many of you will know, um, Mark Price. And so in 2015, he needed some help with marketing, so I jumped in and uh, we went up to Ashburn, Virginia, and I went into their, their cage in the Equinix uh, data center. We fiddled around with some servers and that was very fun for me. And then we went from there to the VSB con. Um, did I say that right? VS, VSB con. V, VBSD, that's it, thank you. VBSDCon. Um, and, uh, and that's where I created this little uh, image uh, for, I think, a social media post that I put out. Um, I spent some time at the Linux Foundation. I was working with the jQuery Foundation, the Node Foundation. I worked on Hyperledger. 
Uh, that kind of eventually brought me around to FreeBSD, where I uh, was connected with Deb and I did some part-time writing. Um, I felt the tug of, uh, of sort of startups and went back into the Kubernetes, Knative, and Flutter communities. And now I'm back as the director of uh, partnerships and research, and I'm really, really excited to be here. So the obligatory office space quote, what, what is it that you would say you do here? What exactly does it mean for someone to do partnerships and research? So that's actually only part of the quote. Do we have any office space fans in the crowd? So what's the rest of the quote? What would you say you do here at? <laughs> Some testing to see how, how big a fan you are. In a tech, in a tech. What would you say you do here in a tech? Uh, so uh, the way that I would describe what I do is um, I, I try to connect with companies that are using FreeBSD, and not just companies, users in general, uh, you know, organizations, uh, individuals, and, and get them involved in the development community. Um, it's not project, but project. So you know, there are, at any given moment in time, lots of big conversations happening in policy circles, kind of public interest technology circles uh, that are both relevant to FreeBSD, that matter to us, right? Things like about cybersecurity, um, you know, various government regula regulations and what both companies and open source communities need to be doing to stay compliant. So there's, you know, all of this stuff happening uh, around the world that really matters to FreeBSD and in the other direction where FreeBSD can help, right? There's so much expertise in this community. Uh, you know, I'm continuously blown away by it and we saw a lot of it on display already and we're just gonna continue to hear from more people in this community talking about you know, the, the innovation that's happening and how we're pushing the boundaries of computing and security. And so you know, we need to make sure that policymakers and people who are shaping opinions hear about that work. So I'm focused on projecting. Um, and then personally, one of my objectives is to just learn, right? FreeBSD is a big technology community. It's an enduring technology community. It's been around for 30 years. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of complicated subsystems. So uh, you know, I want to be in a position where I can present to any general technology audience just about anything uh, FreeBSD related, at least you know, at a intermediate type level. Um, so if I think about like, what have, what have I been doing from a connecting standpoint? So since April, uh, I kind of went back through my notes. And as of today, I have about 20 um, active ongoing conversations with significant uh, kind of upstream. So think of these as like the chip makers and other uh, types of companies like that downstream, so many of the companies that are here, users, and what I call kind of like lateral companies. So what's a lateral company? A lateral company is a company that we need to, we need to have them support FreeBSD, but they're not necessarily a user of FreeBSD. So think like, uh, uh, you know, XDR is an example that comes to mind. Extended, extended uh, oh God, I just had it a minute ago. Help me out. Extended detection and remediation, right? So it's a, a, it's a new sort of way of doing security. So there's a variety of them out there. There's uh, CrowdStrike, uh, Cisco Secure has one, um, StormShield has one. There's a variety of companies that do. Uh, and so when you say, well, what endpoints do you support, right? They'll say, well, you know, the ones that you would expect. And so, you know, I, what I'm pushing for is, well, you know, it's important that you also support FreeBSD and, you know, let, let us work with you to figure out how we make that happen. So that's, that's kind of part of what I'm doing in terms of lateral, uh, what I call kind of lateral, uh, lateral engagement. Um, Part of like projecting uh, is 
OSI has been uh, a really great partner. Uh, OSI is the open source initiative. So um, they have put together uh, what's called an op the Open Policy Alliance, where they're bringing together other open source project projects and communities, specifically like the, the public charity. So who here understands what the difference is between a 501c6 and a 501c3? All right, not many. So can I explain? I'll take a minute and explain. Okay, so just about every open source foundation out there um, is one or the other of those two, right? <clears throat> They're both nonprofit classifications, which means the US government, the, the IRS, recognizes that you are a nonprofit organization. But they're very different types of nonprofit organizations. A 501c6 is a trade association, right? So basically, it's you know, a member organization. It exists, its purpose is to support its members, right? So an organization like the Linux Foundation is a 501c6. Its, its purpose is to support the open source interests of its members. So I used to work at the Linux Foundation. I loved it, it was fun. Good friends over there, they do a lot of great work, but all of the work that I did was with members, with companies, that's what they do. In contrast, the FreeBSD Foundation is a 501c3. So what that means is we're a public charity. So we exist solely and exclusively to support FreeBSD. It's the only reason why we're here, um, to make FreeBSD as good as it can be for the public. That involves working with companies, but it's not only about working with companies. So it's, it's a big difference. So I bring it up in this context because uh, what OSI has done has brought together a whole bunch of other open source 501c3s, open source public charities, to make sure that our voices are heard in the public policy arena. Because, you know, there was a set of voices from the open source community being heard, kind of in drowning out a little bit the, the, the public charity voices. And so that's what OSI has done. It was a great service and I'm really, really excited to support it. So one of the things that I did was I was invited to participate on this panel <clears throat> at All Things Open. And so that gave me an opportunity to raise awareness to FreeBSD, make sure that everybody knows how widely used FreeBSD is, um, talk about some of the advocacy that, that Alan talked about, um, and also talk about kind of some policy issues. So that's, that's kind of the project uh, thing. And then from a presentation standpoint, um, you know, with much patience from Brooks, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, I tried to, and so I'm exactly the right person for this job, I dumbed down and really tried to make it, you know, uh, uh, you know, something that almost anybody who has any general familiarity at all with this concept of memory safety could quickly understand why Cherry matters, right? Um, and so this is evolving, uh, and I'm sure there's room for improvement. But what we did was put together just like two slides, um, this one that sort of sets up the problem, and then this one that describes what it is. And just listening to, to Brooks this morning, I realized that you know, there's, a, there's still, every time I hear him speak, I, I learn more about Cherry. And you know, just the, the, the amount of investment that's gone into this development, uh, I, I, had, I was not previously aware of. So something that I'm thinking about is like a single slide that's like cherry by the numbers. So I don't know, Brooks, what it was that you said, something like 200 million total over lifetime or something like that, dollars invested. And you know, 70% of memory safety vulnerability protected, uh, even more pat of the total number of patches protected against. So. Um, this is an example of kind of some of the work that I've been doing to, to present uh, the work that's happening in this community out. Um, another example, and I don't want to steal 
too much of my colleague Deb's thunder because I know she's gonna present some of these slides tomorrow. But like this is another example. So, you know, when when I've started and I started looking at uh, the history of FreeBSD and the present day of FreeBSD, I was struck by how many firsts, how many things that uh, the industry, everybody, not just FreeBSD, not just FreeBSD users, every computer user benefits from that came from FreeBSD. So open governance is a great example. Everybody expects that, right? You go into any open source foundation these days and you expect that the people who are making the technology decisions are elected by the development community, right? But that certainly wasn't the norm in 1993 when we started it. Um, container virtualization, another example, although I think I heard somebody earlier say that IBM invented it in the 1960s, so maybe I should adjust this. But, um, but jails, I think, you know, really was very innovative. First mandatory access control, first non-Solaris integration of ZFS, first operating system running Cherry, and then thanks to the innovation that's been led by uh, Nginx and Netflix and uh, the NIC makers and you know, several others, tuning across kernel and user space to be able to push this kind of throughput um, on standard hardware is, is just remarkable. So this is how I talk about FreeBSD when I'm talking to companies and I, I think it, 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 you know, it catches people's attention. Um, last one, we were presenting, and I can't remember which company I was presenting to, uh, but they said, hey, if you could include a slide about Beehive, that would be great. And I said, sure, no problem. Um, so I went out looking, and I found a lot of great information, but I didn't find like a single slide that summarized it. So I put this together, um, and uh, people have, have liked it, and I think it serves a pretty good purpose. What I'd love to see is like, you know, more, uh, sort of more slides like this for all the different subsystems uh, within FreeBSD. But this is kind of what I've been doing, right, is, is, uh, is connecting, projecting, and then presenting. Um, my approach has been to, to focus on users. Um, and I, I have a few notes on this one that I'm, if you'll bear with me one second, I couldn't get my presenter mode going exactly the way I wanted. And so I want to pull up my slides on my phone because I want to refer to my notes because I had a brilliant thought about this the other day. At least I thought it was brilliant. Um, sorry. Yep, yeah, okay, great. So, um, so partnerships, right, part of my job is to, you know, develop donations, right, to increase donations to the foundation. Uh, you know, when, you know, when you look at what the FreeBSD Foundation does, um, most of the donations that we get, whether they come from individuals or companies, goes into development work, right? And this is an interesting comparison. Um, you know, the Linux Foundation, for example, they've got something like 900 software projects, I heard recently, uh, and they have three engineers that actually contribute upstream. All of the other contributions to those projects comes from developers who work outside of the Linux Foundation. But FreeBSD Foundation is really very different, and this is in part because of you know, the fact that we are a public charity and we're here to do one thing, which is make FreeBSD as good as it can be and support the community in developing that. Um, so, uh, so when I started looking, so, so anyway, so most of the donations that we get go into development. Um, when I started to look at, uh, you know, who donates consistently to the foundation, 100% of the companies that donate consistently to the foundation contribute code consistently to the community. So that was an aha moment for me, which caused me to say, the path to increasing donations is increasing the number of companies that contribute consistently upstream. So my focus is, how can I help companies get involved, 
upstream? What are the barriers to getting involved? And you know, Alan, I thought you did a really great job talking about sort of the benefit of upstream first. And so, um, so, so anyway, that's, that's my focus, right, is to increase involvement upstream. Um, and so when I'm, and I mentioned that I've got, you know, about 20-ish kind of active ongoing conversations. And in all of them, when we get to the point of, okay, we've talked about it, we understand where you are with your use of FreeBSD, and um, we've, you know, kind of thought through how, um, you know, how the foundation can help you get involved upstream, uh, every single one of those projects starts out with a mentorship component. Right, so that you know, the, the companies can get to a place where they've got committers on staff because that's what makes it sustainable, right? is when you have that built-in capacity. So, um, so I've, been, I've been focused on users. Um, another way that uh, my focus on users has kind of come to life a little bit is through the enterprise working group. So this is something that um, that I've been putting a lot of time into. And it, it came about pretty organically. Uh, we, were, we were talking to a chip maker that um, was sent to us by uh, a large FreeBSD user. <clears throat> and the chip maker was trying to win that company's business and was interested in getting a sense of you know, the market and how many other companies they would be able to sell their chips to if, if they brought up FreeBSD support. So I reached out to a company and I said, hey, you know, I, that was in that space. And I said, hey, I'd love to learn about your use of FreeBSD. And it turned out that um, they were using it, but in a different way than I had thought. They were using it as a general purpose enterprise server. So uh, they were using it, uh, you know, to run all of the things that you would, you know, that most companies these days or a lot of companies these days will use you know, say Ubuntu or whatever. So they were running Samba, they were running Bind, they were uh, running Active Directory, um, you know, m sort of hosting a whole bunch of Java applications so they needed great open JDK support. And they said, you know, long time FreeBSD user, really love it, um, but hitting some limits in some areas. And, you know, and then, but went beyond that and didn't just say, hey, here's a bunch of problems, provided really, really detailed notes. Uh, and so that allowed uh, me and Ed and Joe and a couple others to sit down and look it over. And so when we went back, we said, look, you know, we don't have the capacity to tackle all of these things. Um, but what we can do is, uh, you know, we can put out a call and see if other people are interested in joining this working group. And so we did, and we received quite a bit of interest. So we had about 30 people say that they wanted to help uh, with these features. And, uh, and now we're up to like over 60. Um, and so we've, uh, we've chartered the working group, we've compiled the list of gaps, we've prioritized that list, and right now we're in the process of, uh, of working through it. So um, we, when we prioritized, this is, this is where we landed. Um, so the mean rank, uh, one is most important out of eight, perceived mean difficulty, five is hardest. So, you know, you can see here that cloud native is, is number one, right? Um, and this is, this is very consistent with the feedback that we've been hearing from a whole lot of people. Um, definitive managers for Beehive was number two, Active Directory three, uh, GPU support four, right? You get the idea. Um, so we now have active work streams for cloud native uh, Beehive management, um, OpenJDK, we opened a, uh, so that's one where the foundation recognized that this is a strategic priority for FreeBSD, so we opened a job position and we are in the process of looking at uh, uh, submissions of contractors to do that work. Um, GPU support is the other one that we have, uh, that we're actively working on as well. Um, another example of focusing on the user is the uh, CIS benchmark. So CIS is uh, uh, Center for Internet Security, 
And CIS benchmarks are kind of like the industry standard hardening guide that every CIO, every CISO of any significant size is going to require right before they deploy a major platform. Every single Linux distro has a CIS benchmark. Um, they're, they're, you know, free to create. There's no, there's no licensing fee to create it. But you know, you need to have somebody who has the expertise to do it. Um, so we heard this from a whole lot of people that, you know, it would make my life way easier getting my PCI compliance, getting any number of, uh, you know, achieving any number of types of compliance. Uh, for my FreeBSD install, but it's also, I think, one of those things that in the absence of having it, we're not even considered, right? So a fo you know, by focusing on the user, we were able to say, yeah, this, this matters. Like, we need to have a FreeBSD CIS benchmark. So we talked as a team, we secured the budget, we've contracted with the engineer, we are in the process of setting up the CIS community, uh, and, you know, my, my goal is we'll probably have this done in Q1. So this is, this is really big uh, and is going to really help us. Um, another one is uh, the, so the U.S. government starting in 2024 is, gonna, is going to require that any vendor that licenses software that has a contract with the U.S. government has to submit a attestation saying that their software was developed according to a set of secure software development framework principles. So it's, I know it's a mouthful. Um, but not just their software, also any open source software that they include. So we talked to some folks uh, and we said, would it be helpful for you with your government clients if the FreeBSD Foundation was to provide a secure software development framework attestation for FreeBSD that you could then just snap into your attestation report. Um, and we received you know, universally positive feedback that, yeah, that would be helpful. So we are announcing tomorrow, uh, the press release will go out, and I'm really pleased we uh, secured a quote from NIST as well as from uh, two uh, FreeBSD users um, uh, for this press release uh, that the FreeBSD Foundation will be offering this to any company that partners with the FreeBSD Foundation at any level, right? So, um, and you know, the silver level is, is, you know, for any startup is super inexpensive. Um, so that's another way that we are trying to help users be successful with FreeBSD. Uh, we're rolling it out in two phases. So uh, phase one, it's kind of getting into the minutia, but phase one will effectively attest to the kind of summary version of the um, SSDF requirements. And then phase two will uh, be later next year, and that'll be it for the whole thing. It's pretty extensive, actually. So, um, but we're, we're really excited about this. Uh, so as I wrap up, um, you know, for me, uh, I've always felt, and certainly being part of the FreeBSD community, that the community is really both the journey and the destination. Um, so what I mean by that, and so I mentioned the uh, Synap, the organizational network analysis tool that I kind of helped launch that allowed, you know, executives and corporate leaders to, to see the uh, network of relationships that people use to actually get work done, get, p get past the, the, the org chart. Um, so that friend of mine, Steve Garcia, wrote this book. It just came out, and I'm reading it now. <clears throat> and <clears throat> one of the things that, that he says, that the authors say, uh, and they have a lot of data to, to back this up, um, is that you know, collaborative relationships that span companies, you know, when we, when we get outside of our silo, and we develop collaborative relationships the way that we have in this open source community and in many other open source communities, uh, it increases our individual and organizational creativity and adaptability. It helps us see around corners because we benefit from other people's perspectives who are seeing the industry, the technology, 
uh, the trends, right, from just a slightly different angle. And so we can triangulate those data points and it helps us to react. And we all need that because technology is changing uh, so fast that, um, you know, it, it can be really hard to keep up. Uh, so to me, that's part, one of the ways that community is, is the journey. Um, you know, another way is this great quote that I heard from a friend of mine at Red Hat. It came out, um, I heard it from him, if you all remember, when Oracle announced Unbreakable Linux. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, and, and Red Hat responded with Unfakeable Linux, uh, which was a great retort, I thought. Um, and, you know, uh, and the way that my friend described the situation was, you know, we went in, our customers, of course, called us because Oracle had just announced support for enterprise Linux at 50%, you know, half of what we charge. And, um, and so we went to our customers, and what we said was, like Goldman Sachs, you know, teeny little companies like that, and we said, look, do you really want to buy support for a critical platform piece of software from a company that has not contributed a single line of code upstream. And it was like conversation over. The answer was no, they didn't. Uh, you know, Red Hat didn't have to lower their prices at all. So I think this is true, right? To me, it's like, yes, of course the source code matters. Yes, of course we want the code to be good. But the way that that happens is by having great people working on the code, right? So it's the community, right? It's the source of the code. So when I look at, you know, this conference and I look at this community and I look at the, the, the people and the companies that contribute to FreeBSD, that's great source, right, if you ask me. Um, but it isn't just companies, right? It's, it's people. And I didn't tell Chris, and I don't know if he's watching, but I didn't tell him I was going to do this. But I talked about the Enterprise Working Group. And, um, you know, I, I kind of just dove into that because I, I felt like it was important and it needed to be done. And, uh, and my colleagues agreed. Um, and it quickly kind of became this really big project where we, we all of a sudden had, you know, sort of four or five uh, work streams, development work streams, where we needed to define the requirements, you know, collect feedback, validate the requirements, bounce those requirements against the existing approaches that were out there, figure out what the plan was going to be to get from where we were today to where we wanted to be, right? Recruit volunteers, recruit development volunteers, testing volunteers, right? sort of cat herd all along the way and, and do that five times. Um, and so I, you know, it's one of the things that I love about open source is when you ask for help, you'll very often get it. And so I, on one of the meeting minutes for one of the enterprise working group calls, I said, you know, here's, here's where we are. You know, we've got these five projects that we've identified as high priority. We've got, you know, volunteers in these categories for these ones and none in these categories for the other ones. And Chris just reached out to me out of nowhere and said, hey, I noticed that I was watching the recording and I noticed that you needed a project management volunteer for the Beehive manageability work stream. You know, I'd love to help. And so I said, awesome. And, and you know, it turned out he kind of was like, yeah, you know, I've been sort of like bouncing around a little bit. I've been trying to get involved. I'm not really, I'm not really a committer and that isn't really the path for me to get involved in the FreeBSD community. That's not really the right track, but I really want to, you know, I'm, I'm knowledgeable and I'm, um, I've, I've been around and I've been using it for a long time and I really want to help. So I said, wonderful, perfect. I, I didn't know at the time that he's, you know, runs the Project Management Institute meetup in Austria. Like, he's the leader of that group. He's PMI Agile certified. He's Six Sigma black belt, right? And he has just absolutely been, like, you know, uh, doing an amazing job. I mean, this is just an example of what he's been doing. And he just sort of took it and ran with it. And so, you know, I'm bringing it up in the context because 
you know, want, I think this is a big difference, and it's one of the things that makes FreeBSD really special is, uh, you know, yes, it matters. Yes, we need to have companies involved. But, you know, this is a community of, uh, of people, uh, and Chris is, to me anyway, a really great example of, of that. Um, so my last thing is a request. So, um, you know, uh, I talked about XDR, right, as an example of where, and, and it happens a lot, right? And you heard it, I think, on the panel a little bit, um, where, you know, uh, you know I'll, I'll talk to a vendor and, and I'll say, hey, have you thought about supporting FreeBSD? And they'll say, well, we just don't get asked for it, right? You know, the market demands Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, and, and I even hear that from companies that run on FreeBSD, right, that use FreeBSD in their product. Um, and, uh, and so XDR is a good example. You know, some of the, some of the cloud providers are a good example. Um, you know, we, we're, Ed and I have been in, in the process of having multiple email back and forths uh, to get uh, uh, f support for FreeBSD in .NET, right? Which is a requirement for there to be uh, support for FreeBSD in GitHub Actions, right? And GitHub Actions is the CI system, the default CI system for most of the big open source projects out there, right? Um, and, and so my request is, you know, everybody here cares about FreeBSD, right? FreeBSD matters to all the individuals in this room, and I'm gonna go so far as to say that it therefore matters to all the companies that the individuals in this room represent. So when you're talking to your suppliers, chip makers, XDR companies, right, security providers, you name it. When you're talking to your partners, right, tell them, ask them, what's your FreeBSD story? You guys support FreeBSD? Well, FreeBSD matters to us. It's really important to our business, and we'd like you to support it. Um, you know, if you, if you have a partner page on your website, think about adding FreeBSD. You know, if you have an open source page on your website, add FreeBSD, right? Our, our marketing colleague, uh, Anne, has the logo in, in every format that you could possibly imagine. Um, because the more we do that, the less we will hear, well, nobody asks for FreeBSD, right? If we all start asking for FreeBSD, right, then, then we take that argument off the table and it'll make everybody's lives easier. So that's all I had. Um, thanks. Uh, I'll take any questions. <laughs> it's after lunch, everybody's half asleep. Hey, question. So you talk about CIS benchmarks. Is there any interest on DISA STIGs at all? Say it again. DISA STIGs. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, Yes, absolutely, and you know we're. It's it's definitely come up. Um, so for those who don't know, DISA for the DoD has their own benchmark, like C, like CIS benchmarks. There's a DISA Stig, and if you want to deploy yep. in DoD space, you have to this have system technical implementation guide is what a Stig yep. is. Yeah, yes is the answer, and um, so I don't know. Ian is going to be doing a talk tomorrow from Medify. Ian has connected us with uh, somebody that he works with who works very closely with the government and who has offered to help us when we get to that point. I think, you know, we're, we're sort of, um, you know, crawling before we walk, walking before we run. So we want to knock out the CIS benchmark. Once we have that in place and we have that experience under our belt, we can then say, okay, how do we apply this? How do we, you know, take what we have as a, you know, a starting point with CIS and apply that to some of these other requirements? How much of what we've developed in CIS can be applied? How much is new for DISA, 
right, and that kind of thing. But yeah, good, good point. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Yeah, it's my uh, pleasure. Thank you.